so it's all about the Queen this week. Welcome to the uh, Royal Rota, where HM, Her Majesty's been out and about um, in some force, really, both in Balmoral and in London. In fact, it's the first time she's been back at Buckingham Palace for some considerable time. So uh, your weekly Royal Rota podcast is quite Queen heavy this week, would you say, Lizzie? I'd say it's quite Queen heavy. And maybe you could treat our viewers to what you were just playing for me before we came oh, on, on, on this new device here on the yeah yeah maybe um <laughs> i've got a, i've got someone new to rest my um my my laptop this is quite useful so actually if i get bored when you're um talking i'll just start well you could maybe do we could do the rundown to god save the queen which is what chris was actually playing before we came on but he's gone all shy and isn't playing it for you now i'm just a bit worried i get it wrong God save our great gracious queen, long live our noble queen, God. Done. Well, I mean, you, no one could say that we don't bring you everything. We bring you everything. everything. Literally, okay. I learned that in the last um, two minutes, so... Uh, I'll, 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 I'll bring you a better rendition next time we have to do this from home. I, I'm at it. home. We can mix up the intro to the podcast every week and you could, you could do it on the keyboard. Well, only when I'm here. I'm, I'm at home uh, for reasons that I won't bore you with. Uh, Liz is in the studio. Um, so, um, yeah, do you want to go and do your, your rundown of Royal Robinson-ness and then we will um, start talking about what's happened in the last week? And I'll sort out my ear, which has kind of gone a bit weird. So, uh, as you say, a quite a queen heavy week. Uh, while I thought the Duchess of Cambridge sort of stole the show last week, I think the Queen oh, has. Oh yeah, yeah. So. Uh, you said it was a good week for Kate. Would you say it's a good week for the Queen? Yeah, I would say it's a good week right. for the Queen. So she was out with her son, the Prince of Wales, earlier in the week, and they were uh, planting a tree for the Jubilee, and this is all part of the Queen's Green Canopy Initiative that we've spoken quite a lot about on this podcast. She then at the weekend opened the Scottish Parliament and there was a really uh, lovely mention of the Duke of Edinburgh in her speech. She then travelled back to Windsor uh, and she did an engagement there yesterday, which was Wednesday, where she met the Royal Regiment of the Canadian Artillery. And today hotfooted it to London for um, probably the biggest event we've seen at Buckingham Palace since the pandemic started. She was there for the Commonwealth Games Baton Relay. We had a royal baby name this week with a nod to Her Majesty oh, in the name. Mm -hmm. uh, Not really that, was it? No. An update on the Prince Andrew case. Uh, we'll bring you the latest on that. Uh, Prince William's Earthshot series on the BBC got underway. We've had a couple of episodes of that so far. And the Countess of Wessex speaking out about the menopause in a round table discussion this week. Yeah, quite, um, I would say, an unusual subject, but I think most people agree uh, good that it is being talk, spoken about and discussed uh, increasingly these days. Um, but we should start at the top of the tree, shouldn't we, uh, with the Queen? Um, but I'm not going to go to the tree. I'm going to go to the baton, because uh, literally in the last uh, few hours, the Queen has... Uh, handed over the baton, she stuffed in a message from her good self. In fact, um, have a look at this video that um, Buckingham Palace put out a short while ago of the Queen signing her name at the bottom of this message. Only the Queen, and presumably her private secretary, knows what's in that message. Uh, and it won't be read out until this baton has travelled, get this, 90,000 miles to all 54 uh, Commonwealth countries, which I think I read somewhere was 72 nations and territories of those 54 Commonwealth countries. And it would do all that over the next sort of uh, eight or nine months or so, and then be back in Birmingham ready for the Commonwealth Games in July next year, when the Queen's message will be read out to all those watching at the opening ceremony. Yeah, at the opening ceremony on the 28th of July next year. And as I said earlier, this is the first time we've seen a big event happened uh, at Buckingham Palace since the pandemic started. So, um, yeah, since the Queen kind of left uh, London, didn't she, uh, for, for uh, Windsor. And um, that's kind of the first big thing that she's been back for. Yeah, and the, the baton, as you say, she, she put the note in and that won't be read out until the opening 
ceremony and the relay will now span 294 days on its 90,000 mile journey. Now, I thought 90,000 was pretty impressive. I thought, wow, 90,000 miles, that's quite a lot. But apparently it's only half the distance that the Baton did for the Commonwealth Games when they were held in Australia, I think on the Gold Coast, uh, because, do you know why? No. Ah, I'm about to educate you and all of our listeners and viewers. <laughs> Um, they've decided to reduce the number of miles that the Baton is going to do uh, in order to reduce its carbon footprint. Ah. Get that. Very environmentally so, friendly Baton. Yeah. So, so the environmental friendly Baton, which I was reading, also has like an LED light in it. It can actually um, take the, uh, the heart rate of the person holding it. Um, good job I'm not going to do it because it would be uh, reading very high rates for mine if I had to walk or run around the road. Um, and then it's going to go, so from Buckingham Palace, it went round the Queen Victoria Monument, which is often called the, the wedding cake, the, the thing in front of Buckingham Palace, uh, and then went up the Mall, and then it's off to Birmingham, which is the sort of host city for the Commonwealth Games, before the baton goes off to Cyprus um, on Saturday, the 9th of October, and then into Africa, the first of the 19 countries of the Commonwealth, uh, in Africa, so quite quite some journey ahead. Some journey, and you're right. The the baton is uh, not just a baton with a message in. It includes a 360 degree camera, a heart rate monitor, atmospheric sensors, and LED lighting. And in addition to the message that's gone inside the baton, there is a strand of platinum, and that's in now. Not why would it have a strand of platinum? I ask you. That's in a nod to the Queen's platinum jubilee, which will of course be next year as well in, in the well, kind of game. culminates yeah it kind of culminates uh, quite um in a good way i was actually um listening earlier that this this commonwealth games was meant to be held uh, in durban in south africa um but isn't and no one's actually given me the reason why it isn't so birmingham had to step in rather last minute um so the stadiums and the aquatic center is all going to be uh, on time but the accommodation apparently for the uh, athletes isn't so they're going to literally have to go and stay in the Holiday Inn. So before I popped into the studio, I actually went down to Buckingham Palace and spoke to Dame Louise Martin, who is president of the Commonwealth Games Federation. And she was explaining uh, the job, the great job that Birmingham has done to get ready to be able to host the Games so quickly uh, in 2022 and why Birmingham is such a great place for it to be held. You know, why, why Birmingham and what does Birmingham have to offer for the Commonwealth Games? Well, Birmingham have been fantastic throughout this because they stepped in when Durban withdrew, uh, so they've had a four and a half year run in, but what they have done for us is proved to us and to Commonwealth that you can host a Games, that you can run it to build it up a Games in, in the four and a half years, and the type of Games that they're doing. And, you know, with the extra ones, they're doing like T20 cricket that's going to women's cricket, so we're going to have the largest ever women's medal programme ever, so, and the largest para school programme. But more importantly for us is Birmingham actually has people from all the 72 countries of the Commonwealth Games Federation living there. And some of our countries will not be able to bring their relatives or anything like that, A for cost and B for just for safety, for, for you know, for the fear of COVID and all of this sort of thing. But they've already got people there in Birmingham who will support them. So we're, we're mobilising all of that. So it's a, there's a team to support when the main team comes in, which will be the first time that will ever be done. Um, so what it was like down at the palace, the Queen was there in her um, big orange number. Uh, so what, are we, what was it like down there? I couldn't, I didn't see that many crowds. It was like a sort of miserable October mistiest morning, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was very grey, but uh, there were, there were crowds sort of kind of gathering around to see what was going on, but, but the mall itself was clear for, for the relay to happen. And I spoke to Kadina Cox, who was a Paralympic gold medalist. Yes. She was the first baton bearer. And also, and she Lauren, did the tour of the. Um, she did a, a lap or two laps of the uh, Queen Victoria Monument, didn't she? She did. She was actually handed the baton by the Queen. She was saying, you know, um, she, she better not drop it, basically. Uh, and then, then it was handed to various not, other. Not the best thing to do if you're the first no. holder of the baton, no. No. And then there were various other baton bearers, including Lauren Price, who was an Olympic gold medalist in Tokyo, and she also spoke to Prince William before she went out to. To Tokyo 
um, and she was saying kind of what it meant to her to have the royal family so involved in uh, the yeah. Commonwealth Games. Yeah, and it's going to be quite a big event next year. Prince Edward was there. He's kind of like the vice patron or something, isn't he? The Commonwealth Games Federation. The Queen's the patron. Uh, so she had some support from her youngest son. And we also bring you some other news about her other son that's in the news a lot, uh, Prince Andrew, uh, later on. But um, yeah, Queen looking pretty well, I thought. Um, we, well, we've actually seen her quite a bit this week, haven't we? Because we mentioned that she dug a hole, stuck a tree in it up in Balmoral. Um, she went and chatted to some Canadians. What do you want to talk about on that front? The hole in the ground or the Canadians? Let's talk about the tree. The tree. Right. So we've um, told you before about the Queen's green canopy, uh, stick a tree in the ground for the Jubilee, pretty much. It's what you want to do. The first tree went in the ground on the 1st of October, which was planting season. And now, now I'm talking about this. I'm wondering whether we actually discussed it last week. Did we discuss this last week? We, we sort of threw ahead to it, but it hadn't actually happened and we didn't have the pictures, which we do now and can bring you. I'm actually, yeah, I'm looking at my calendar. The 1st of October was a Friday. Is that right? So we didn't have the pictures to put in it. Right. OK, so, um, so here is Prince Charles and uh, Mrs Queen doing the tree. This was, um, oh, you know the tree. You know the tree name, don't you? I do. It was a Copper, Copper beach. beach. Which is like a beech tree with red leaves. Um, and they wanted to stick in lots of native trees into the ground, um, as many as possible over the next year to mark uh, the Queen's Silver Jubilee. But you can only do it in the winter months in the growing, the planting season. Silver Jubilee? Silver, sorry, platinum. Platinum Jubilee. Silver was a while ago, wasn't it? Silver was a little while ago. Yeah, we've had a few 1977, at least I was alive for the Silver Jubilee, unlike other people on this podcast. Yeah, no, definitely not around for the silver. Um, yes, this, you're right. This is all about planting the right trees in the right place at the right time. And we've had a sort of long lead up to uh, planting season since the initiative was first announced. But planting season is now underway from uh, October and it goes through until March. And they want you to get out and plant as many trees as possible. And if you don't have room at home, then in your school, community, in your park, school, yep. um, wherever you can find, as long as it is the right place and the right kind of tree. Yeah, I was thinking about sticking one in the street outside because I saw a little bit of ground, uh, a bit of grass outside someone's house. And I wondered what, what they thought if they just found me there one night sticking a tree in the ground. But um, I could say that the if Queen you, asked me to do it. If you popped a, if you do plant a tree, then you'll get to appear on the Queen's green canopy map where all trees being planted are logged. So you can you can see where your tree is. So the first one must have gone in. We should um, get up the web page, didn't we? And the first one's gone in at Balmoral. Um, uh, a few people on the on the pictures uh, pointed out that there was plenty of horses that came to gather to watch the to watch the ceremony behind them. Well, there's queen, there's horses, isn't there? Well, but um, queen, actually, what I quite like about the map is uh, when you I had a look at it the other day, and when you find the queen's tree, the the other trees around the country have a different different pin color. The queen's one is gold. Naturally, yeah. There's I wonder if she's going to plant any more, actually. There was one at Windsor. Do you remember earlier in the year when they launched the initiative? She and Prince Charles yes. planted one at Windsor. That also yes. appeared on the Which map. Which was the odd thing because they can only plant trees during the planting season. And that was kind of the end of the winter the planting end. season. And yeah. this is now the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. And then so actually, some, so that's, that's the Queen done in Balmoral then. See you, Balmoral. Nice to, nice to have been around. See you next year kind of thing. Yeah, so, uh, this, when we saw her on Friday the 1st, that was the first time she'd done a public engagement for... Yeah. almost two months since she arrived officially at mm. Balmoral for her sort of traditional summer break so she she's had some proper downtime away from public duties and now she's back and you know the last week or so has clearly been quite busy for her. Yeah but you say proper downtime I mean we do know that someone who's been staying there that might have caused her a few uh, troublesome moments of course Prince Andrew has been in uh, Balmoral Prince Andrew he who is accused um, of some uh, accusations of sexual assault by Virginia Dufry. He's been in Balmoral, but we think he's now left Balmoral as well and found, found the petrol, I think, as one newspaper put it, to drive south. You might know if you live in the UK, there's been a bit of a problem getting petrol in the last uh, 10 days or so. Um, Prince Andrew, however, did find enough to get himself from Balmoral back down to Royal Lodge in Windsor. What was quite interesting on the timing of that is that he we hadn't had a royal baby name from his daughter, Princess Beatrice, and her husband, Eduardo Mapelli Mozzi. Prince Andrew left. He, didn't get connected. he arrived uh, back at back in Windsor 
and it wasn't long afterwards that we received the name so I think it must have been connected to that she wanted to introduce the baby to him um, before announcing it to the world which mm. which you can quite understand. Uh, so Prince Andrew then um, a new development in that case uh, as we're on the subject of Prince Andrew uh, which is that his lawyers have requested and have now been given permission to see the sealed document that his accuser Virginia Dufry signed in 2009 with Jeffrey Epstein. This document has now been released by Epstein's estate and been given to Prince Andrew's lawyers for them to look at because they think there might be something in there which suggests that she's signed away her, um, her rights to launch any future legal action. Um, however, I mean, it has to be said that Prince Andrew's team have not seen this document before. It's sealed, obviously, therefore they haven't seen it. Um, and there could be stuff in there that, that, that isn't helpful to them. Who knows? Uh, this is just pure speculation, but um, they will now be handed this, uh, this document, which was the, the legal development of this week. You know, we like to bring you a, a legal development every week in Prince Andrew. Um, and that was this week's legal development. And um, Prince Andrew's new Hollywood lawyer, Andrew Brettler, said in that first hearing, that virtual hearing we had a few weeks ago, he said, there has been a settlement agreement that the plaintiff, that's Virginia Dufry, has entered into a, into a prior action that releases the Duke and others from any and all potential liability. So it seems that for Prince Andrew's team that they think that this document could potentially yeah. be key to nullifying the assault case against him. Yes, exactly. So um, they now have it um, and they will pour over it in great detail, I am sure. The next However, development I in this... should just also say that, that uh, Virginia Dufry's lawyer said uh, in previous court papers that he believes that the release of this document is irrelevant to the case against Prince Andrew. So yes. her team don't think it's going to stop the case. Prince Andrew's team I think there might be a case yeah. where it nullifies it. And he continues to deny the uh, serious allegations that have been made against him. He also says that he never recalls meeting Virginia Dufry. Um, and the next development in this case, the scheduled development in this case, is in November, isn't it, when uh, Prince Andrew has to respond to the lawsuit? Yeah, we know he has until October the 29th to respond to the papers that were served to him earlier this month. And then the first pre-trial hearing that will be on November the 3rd so those are the next the key dates we have November the 3rd right um what else can we tell you about uh this week um, we, we, um while, while we're on the York should we should we give you some could um, do you the baby, baby stuff royal baby yeah. News. Yes. yeah you mentioned that there was a baby and that the baby has a name what we failed to do is tell you what the name is so, um, so this is Prince Andrew's eldest daughter, Princess Beatrice. Uh, regular viewers and listeners of this podcast will know that I get them muddled up all the time. Uh, Princess Beatrice is the older one who is married to Eduardo Mapelli Mozzi. Uh, she's just had a baby and the baby's got a name. The baby was a girl, I believe. The baby was a girl, the Queen's 12th great grandchild. And she was born on Saturday, September the 18th. And she is called Sienna Elizabeth Napelli Mozzi. Sienna Elizabeth. I wonder why they chose the name Elizabeth. So um, I think is everyone is everyone of the Queen's great grandchildren? Isn't Charlotte called Charlotte Elizabeth Diana? And uh, Harry yeah. and Meghan's child is called Elizabeth or Lily or Lilibet or, or we've been over that enough times, so we don't need to go over that anymore. And now we have a Sienna Elizabeth. Any more Elizabeths? Ooh. Are you aware of? Well, um, Eugenie's got uh, August Philip. She did the nod to. Oh, yeah. Couldn't really call August August Elizabeth because that would be <laughs> what you could. I mean, there's no reason why you could not, but um, clearly. But Sienna, I think, is a nice nod to the Italian from Eduardo Mapelli Mozzi and Elizabeth, obviously, a nod to um, Beatrice's. It's not the nod, it's the Queen's name. It's not a nod, it is the yeah. Queen's name. It is the so, Queen's um, name. Yeah. It is the Queen's name. Yeah. Um, and with that announcement, we got rather than a photograph, we had. Um, uh, Sienna's footprints. Yeah, people are quite big on feet, aren't they? Um, and pictures of feet and footprints and toes and things. So yes, we had some more feet, but we haven't had a face. It's up to them, of course, whether they want to show us the face of the baby. But um, as it presently stands, we just have a name and some footprints in the sand. Yeah, Princess, Princess Beatrice is quite private, so I think it probably 
didn't come as a surprise that she sure she quite support. private although they jumped onto um instagram and twitter to announce it isn't it beatrice is on uh twitter isn't she she's at yorkie b and it's in, it's eugenie that's on insta eugenie's big on insta yeah. yes if you and could get on that, instagram because uh, most people uh, will know that it all went out and went down in mm -hmm. some big way this week uh, all of facebook services did beatrice said on twitter that they're they're all doing well and wolfie who is her stepson is the best big brother to Sienna. And then this Eduardo, is Edo's other Edo's child by another marriage. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from his from a previous partnership. And um Edo said on Instagram, he wrote a really lovely post actually saying, uh, our life together has just begun and I can't wait to see all the amazing things that await us. Feeling so much love and gratitude from my amazing wife, baby Sienna and Wolfie. These are the days I never want to forget. This week, a friend said to me the sweetest saying that with every child, you grow a whole new heart. A massive thank you to the midwife and the amazing team at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. Very good. Well, congratulations to them and the whole York family, um, which includes Sarah, the Duchess. She's been quite quiet. And I haven't seen a post from her, have I? Or have I missed it? Ooh, that I have. No, I don't think I've seen That's one. quite unusual for Sarah Ferguson. Maybe she could have put a post about her babies and reminded everyone that she's recently written a book. <laughs> we'll go and double check that she hasn't, but I, I don't think okay, she has. Okay, fine. Um, so from the Yorks to, do you want to do Wessexes or more Windsors? I quite like the fact that you notice that the Queen um, is a regular reader of the Times newspaper and uh, actually we should have a listen, shouldn't we? Um, that she was talking to the Canadians about a picture on the front page of the Times this week. Well, the picture was rather so what the Queen was doing, what HM was doing at Windsor was um, honouring the Royal Canadian uh, something artillery, no, Royal, well, yeah, you got Royal Regiment of, of Canadian Artillery. There we are. Yeah, All the words in the right order. And uh, battery A and battery B, wasn't it, that were, were, were which were invented or formed in, in 1871, which makes them 150 years old this year. So that was why the Queen uh, was honouring them and talking to some of the Canadians. And they've just taken on guard duties at both London and Windsor, and that's for the first time. And what she was referring to in that clip you heard where she's talking about the Times is that the Times had on their front page the other day uh, the regiment uh, undertaking guard duties next time you hear the queen speak she'll be talking about in that podcast that i watch and listen to every week called the royal rota well i particularly she like the way they did x or y what do you think she'd have made of your god save the queen uh, rendition? Uh, she would have probably sent around her her finest musicians to teach mm -hmm. me uh, <laughs> how, how to play it Anyway, um, I digress. Uh, so the Queen's been at Windsor, lots of pictures of her there. Um, I presume she's staying at Windsor. We're back to that sort of pattern that we had before the summer, aren't we? The Queen stays at Windsor, pops up to Buckingham Palace when she's got some work to do and then shuffles back. Yes, I, I think so. That is where we are on, on that front. She also um, did, um, if we're on the Queen, back to the Queen, she also was opening the Scottish Parliament, wasn't she, before she had... Oh, blimey, out. yeah, that's not on my list, actually. I'll add the list. Scottish Parliament. Should we talk about the Scottish Parliament? Should we talk about the Scottish yeah. Parliament? Yeah, okay. the Queen was at the Scottish that. Parliament, opening the Scottish Parliament with uh, the Prince of Wales and Duchess of Cornwall, who in Scotland are known as... The Duke and Duchess of Rothsey. Correct. And they were at the Scottish Parliament, opening the sixth session of the Scottish Parliament, um, where the Queen... Uh, actually, the Queen gave a speech, and actually we should listen to this, shouldn't we? Because she spoke about uh, Prince Philip in public for the first time and about how many happy memories uh, she and he had in Scotland. So have a listen to the Queen speaking to uh, members of the Scottish Parliament at the opening of the Scottish Parliament on Saturday. While some of you will have differences of opinion, I trust you will continue to work together. Your service here is carried out in the presence of the mace and I encourage you to draw inspiration from the founding principles of wisdom, justice, compassion, and integrity. I have spoken before of my deep and abiding affection for this wonderful country and of the many happy memories Prince Philip and I 
always held of our time here. So as you say, the first time we've heard her speak about the Duke of Edinburgh publicly since his death in April, and we know how much Scotland meant to them and how much their time at Balmoral mm. meant. Yeah. Talking about how the royals have uh, been saying things in public they don't normally say, um, Countess of Wessex, talking about the, 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 the menopause this week, which actually is a very important subject for, I mean, every single woman will go through it at some point. And um, it's something that she's very keen on raising awareness of, particularly when it comes to sort of women in the workplace and how actually a lot of them may feel like when they hit a certain age, they might have to leave or they can't manage and they don't get the support, which actually was what her speech was all about. So um, the Countess was speaking in her patron of well-being of women, and it was as part of a roundtable discussion, discussion that she made these comments, and it was to mark World Menopause Awareness Month, which is October, and it's estimated that 900,000 women in the UK have quit their jobs due to the menopause. So she wanted to raise awareness and uh, suggest that more needs to be done to support women and keep opportunities going for women, not just in their 40s, but their 50s, 60s, etc. And to think that women are having to leave the workplace because of this is just tragic. We are fabulous in our 40s. We're even more fabulous in our 50s, 60s and 70s. And we need to celebrate that and keep those opportunities going for women. And we cannot let anybody leave that workforce unfulfilled and also feeling that they have got to slope off into the shadows. It's not right. And we've got to be able to change that. Now, there's been a series of documentaries on the BBC this week, uh, some of them fronted by Prince William himself, with people like David Attenborough uh, uh, and others, all to do with the Earthshot Prize. Now, that kind of reaches a a crescendo, a climax, isn't it? On the 17th of October, when they've got the prize giving ceremony, they give out the million quid five times over. Um, so uh, we've had quite a few of those documentaries. Again, a, a real insight into William's passion and where we think a lot of his focus and time and energy and work will go in the coming years. Yeah, I think I said last week that Earthshot for him is sort of the equivalent of his father's Prince's Trust or his grandfather's Duke of Edinburgh Award. This is really where a lot of his focus is going to be and this five part documentary series each episode takes one of the earth shots one of the issues that they're looking to help try and solve over the next decade um, and it sort of pulls them apart looks at where the issues are and the opportunities or the ideas and the solutions being created around the world to try and solve these problems our planet is now in crisis its delicately balanced systems are becoming more and more unstable with every passing year. So for the sake of future generations, let's act now. We had a lot of Kate last week, not so much Kate this week, but she did do uh, one event. Um, I was reading that she was wearing some checkered number. I even got an email telling me about where I can get hold of said item of clothing that Kate was wearing. Um, anyway, uh, she was out and about uh, once this week, was Kate. She was, she was at UCL, the university, and that dress you're referring to, uh, she also wore in Bradford, and it was from Zara, and uh, in the sale it cost £16, pounds, which is what Such everyone was news. excited about. I saw the email, and it said there's been a, there was a 300% increase in searches for this dress, apparently, or skirt, or blouse. But more it was. importantly than the dress, she was at UCL yes, for about a new study that they have into early years and um, this is obviously uh, while we talk about William's focus being on the environment Kate's focus is very much on the early years. Yes it is and I'm uh, off now to go and see if I can find that dress on Zara and add my, uh, add my own search to the all the other searches that are going on and I will mm. just um, mm. no I will <laughs> I will learn how to play God Save the Queen properly next week so see you later bye bye.